when I became vulnerable enough to make the call and simply say to a stranger, I need help. Can you help me? It, it changed me. It set me on a course of complete change. So that's, that's a, 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 a mouthful right there, that whole story. But as we talk with people, it, it's been amazing to me how often this is the recurring story of people's lives. We were born, we're excited, something happens, we go into a bush. When we get in the bush, we then create behaviors that seem like our life problem. And then our entire focus becomes changing my behavior that was caused by the bush. But really, we need to tap into what sent us into the bush. Hey, it's Rocky. Welcome to Rich Your Soul. Today's guest is Mark Delaney, who's going to share how to live a life on purpose. Imagine it's 12 months from now and you've achieved your major life goals. How does it feel to be in the best shape of your life, to wake up energized, excited about the day, to have great relationships and friends who support you and propel you forward? How does it feel to have an excess of money, to be able to make the choices you want, to be fearless and open to trying new adventures? Imagine being connected to the universe and it providing everything you desire. It's possible over time, and your past does not dictate your future. The only thing holding you back from this vision is you. It's time to take control of our thoughts and use them to our advantage. Welcome to Richer Soul, where we achieve our dreams and bring balance to health, wealth, relationships, time, and spirituality. If you have not had a chance to listen to episodes one through nine, I encourage you to go back and listen to the framework behind Richer Soul and how to create the life of your dreams. You can also find all the show notes for this episode at richersoul.com. While you're there, you can sign up for a monthly email where I share the best articles I read this month, let you know about upcoming episodes and share a little wisdom. You can also listen to coaching calls under the coaching calls tab. I also share the most interesting articles I read every week on Facebook at facebook.com forward slash richer soul. And there's also a Facebook group where you can ask questions and interact with other listeners. Today's quote is from Steve Maraboli. The universe doesn't give you what you ask for with your thoughts. It gives you what you demand with your actions. Sure, you have to think about what you want, but you also have to do. And that's what we're going to talk about today. Before we do that, let's cover last week's action step. It was to start journaling. I admit I do struggle with this one. I've been doing a little bit better. And I've been writing down some of the things and some of the observations I'm seeing in the world as we go through all of the changes. I think it would be helpful for me if we have to face something similar in the future. I know... Some of the thoughts from the downturn of 2009 pop up in my head and how the stock market is not necessarily related to the job market or to the economy directly in the moment and that there is it's somewhat of a leading indicator versus a lagging indicator. That's not to say that things are going to be perfect in the market going forward. I still have a lot of concerns. I'm also working on a gratitude journal just writing down things that small things that I'm I'm grateful for. How are you doing? Wow, the world's changed a lot and we're going to have to change too. Hopefully life will start to open back up. However, it's going to take a while to get back to normal. We also have to pay for all the spending the government did to keep the world moving. Being strategic and being bold is more important than ever. I'm far more focused on my investments and watching for opportunity. We must take action and step up in times like these. I'm becoming more intentional in how I do things. How are your new routines serving you? 
When life does return to normal, what are you going to do differently? Did something you think was super important now not matter anymore? We'll touch on that a little bit in today's show. Our guest is Mark Delaney, and he's one of my friends from one of the mastermind groups that I participate in. I've also been through his course on knowing your purpose. I've sponsored some of his programs. Mark also has a special offer for you, and I'll share that at the end of the show. Mark and his wife, Adina, have always been in the business of inspiring and encouraging the lives of others. They've spent most of the last 20 years in education. They've educated people all the way from kindergarten through 50 years old. Their mission is to help people align their life so that they build a powerful legacy that makes a great impact. Mark and Adina love the simple things in life. Simple things mixed with great love and purpose. A hike, a trip to the grocery store, or a trip to the gym are all filled with fun. They believe that great relationships lead to a great life. Their three kids are now adults, each one passionately pursuing life with boldness to make a difference in the life of others. Let's meet our guest. Welcome to Richer Soul, Mark Delaney. It's great to have you join us today. I tell you, I love your podcast, and it's an honor to be on it with you. Thank you, and I'm honored to have you here. Uh, I am looking forward to this conversation. I think it's going to be amazing. So we always start at the beginning. What was it like when you were growing up, and how much did your family and school teach you about money? I grew up with uh, six siblings, and nobody taught me anything about money. <laughs> Uh, if I learned anything about money, it was simply by living life. Uh, as a little as a little child, I had a paper route. Probably by about fifth grade, me and my brothers had a paper route. It was after school, and that probably is where I really got my thinking about money, which is simply you just work and you get money. Now, no one taught me what to do with it. And so back in the day at that time, to get money, you had to collect from the customers. <laughs> you had to go door to door. And at the time, it was every two weeks. I think it was $2.40 I had to collect. And quite frankly, the only time I would collect is if there was a special going on uh, for baseball cards or maybe a special going on at the local restaurant, like 39 cent cheeseburgers. And so my brother and I would be like, hey, let's go collect so we can go buy some cheeseburgers. So uh, no, nobody really taught me anything about money. I learned some basic uh, uh, principles just by having to work. And thankfully, looking back, my parents did not have a lot of money. So if I wanted something, I had to go out and, and make it happen. And so I did learn work ethic. If I, wanna, if I want money, I'm going to have to work. So I am very thankful for that one lesson I learned. If you want money, you have to go out and earn it. And that you do. It's surprising. So you didn't have a regular collection schedule that you, you went out and collected. You just kind of did it when you wanted. Yeah. Yeah. There was no rhyme or reason. I was either hungry or I, want, or I wanted baseball cards. And that spurred me on to collect. <laughs> Interesting. Because I, I had a paper route, too. And I think it's a great way for kids to learn um, how to kind of essentially run their own business. Because there's a lot of customer service there's showing up every day, right? You, you know, the paper comes out every day. You, you got to show up at the time and make sure it's delivered. And so I think there's great lessons that, that can be learned from that. Oh, absolutely. I, I think without a work ethic, we're in big, big trouble. But it's funny, my wife, who lived two states away as a child, had the paper route the same number of years that I did. Of course, we didn't know of each other. Her father had a forced savings plan on, on her whole deal. So when we got married, she had a number of accounts with literally thousands of dollars from the paper route. And I, I didn't have a penny from my paper routes, but she had thousands of dollars doing the same thing at the same time. So I was thankful for her dad and, uh, because we had money for cars because of her paper routes. That is impressive. So you said multiple accounts. How did that work? You know, I, I don't even know. I just know that he had her uh, investing into, uh, I forget what the accounts were even called, but just some simple accounts that collected a little bit of interest over the, case, over the course of time, that uh, monthly the money went into those accounts and it wasn't up to her. 
Did she get to spend any of it? She spent very little. She spent just a little bit of the money. But I want to say, I want to think it was over half of it went into these accounts to draw interest over the course of time and, and uh, build up a little nest egg. And it works. I mean, that's the entire principle of how I built wealth. It's the principle behind Profit First is you essentially, as the money comes in, you take a portion of it and you put it in an account and you don't touch it and it will grow and it will build and you let the compounding curve take effect. And next thing you know, you're wealthy. Yeah. I think that for me as a, as a man, I, I can see how, you know, as a child, my thought process with money is you have to work in order to get it. And that certainly is true. It struggled. I struggled as an adult to get past the threshold of, of not just thinking, okay, work to get money to pay your bills. But to go to that next level of using income to create income and to build a nest egg, if you will. So my wife had that other dimension that for me, and I think I see a lot of people that do this, we never move beyond that childhood kind of thinking that I simply have to work to get the money to buy this next thing I want or buy this next meal that I want. And I think yeah, there are probably a lot of people living in the moment who aren't thinking the bigger picture beyond that. So did you do anything different then with your kids or did she do anything to kind of teach that lesson to them? Yeah, with our kids, we did simple things like we, we definitely emphasized uh, tithing to give our kids the, the, the principle of stewardship, that nothing you have do you really own, but you're a steward of it. So with our kids, it was usually um, save half of it, and then you could spend 40%, and then 10% you gave to the church. And once again, that was a, a, we didn't do that really religiously. I would say we did it more spiritually. And when I say spiritually, it's training their, their hearts and minds that they're a steward of everything that they have in their life. Um, and then I think before they were, um, uh, before they graduated uh, our house, they had, they had set up uh, retirement accounts that they were automatically putting money into from their uh, paychecks and whatnot. Um, we, we've never had, as a family, we've never made a lot of money, but we've always believed in core principles of, of saving, uh, core principles of giving, and, and being good stewards of it. And so it's fun to see our kids now. They're all um, adults. They've all la launched out of our house. But they understand stewardship of money, so they, they use it wisely. They believe in, in saving, and they also believe in working hard. So those core principles of, of working hard, being a steward of your money, it's very exciting to see how that plays out in an adult's life. And I'm sure over time as they grow, if they keep following those principles, they will have built wealth because it works. You just have to keep showing up and doing it. It's really not that hard. Yeah. Yeah, it's really not. It's fun to see one our oldest son, uh, his wife is in residency. So just in the last year, she reached the phase where she starts to get paid for all this education she's received. But they decided early on that they're just going to keep living off of his income even after she get, starts getting paid so that the money that she begins to make will just go towards paying off the student loans from her programs. And I know for doctors, that's tough. You, you end up going into a lot of debt to be able to get your degree. And depending on how you handle that, some, some doctors are wise and they're doing what your kids are doing. They quickly get out of debt before they start spending and that that really builds up a super strong foundation because it's not just how much you make. It's really about how much you keep. Absolutely. Absolutely. And it's fun to see them. My son's driving a 2002 vehicle. I think she's driving a, a 2007. They're living a, they live in a small apartment. Their dream is not, OK, now now we're in residency. Now we have more money. 
Now we're going to buy a car to impress people. Now we're going to buy this big house. They're keeping their their life very, very, very simple, uh, enjoying all the simple things. Because life can be enjoyed just as much uh, without spending money as life can be enjoyed spending a lot of money. It's just a matter of perspective. But to see these two young people fully enjoying life. Just doing all the simple things and uh, they don't have to spend money to have a blast together. So it's fun to see them drive up in the 2002 car, jo- enjoying life, enjoying each other. And, and the, the money she's now making goes towards paying off the debt. And that's impressive. And I think that's what people need to realize. And unfortunately, with the amount of commercialism, we think we need something in order to enjoy life. And I know I struggled with that for a good part of my life. Now it's just understanding that you don't need anything to be happy. You can be happy in the moment mm. and enjoy what you have. It sounds so simple, but it's it's hard to turn off all that noise and desire and what society tells you you have to have. And I, I love how you say it. it is noise. We, we'd spend a lot of time with couples helping them to kind of build the foundation of their life so they can leave a legacy and be a bright light in the world. And the number of times I'll meet with couples that they don't have a lot of money and we'll ask them questions like, so what do you do for fun? And they'll say, well, you know, we buy these cheap popsicles from the store and we'll play in the front yard eating these popsicles and we wrestle on the living room uh, floor and throw each other off the couches and the little kids. And, and I see the look in their eyes and I'm like, do you realize you are not missing it? Like th- that's living and that's living well. But I also know the stories of couples that they have the money. And the only time that they at least perceive or, 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 or indicate they're having fun is when they're at Disney World or going on some extravagant trip or buying some extravagant thing. And that is a, that's a dangerous cycle for my happiness to hinge on extravagant things because the greatest of happiness in life can happen in our living room with marbles. (laughs) Like there doesn't have to be the spending of money to have fun and, and experience great love together. No, it's a shift in mindset. It's how you look at the world and how you, you look at things. And when you can make that shift and say no and just be content, that's impressive. It's not easy. I, I, it's hard. I know it's hard for me. <laughs> it's almost like establishing an appetite. Uh, if, if you establish an appetite for like Twinkies, it's going to be really, really difficult to be satisfied with some broccoli or <laughs> chicken breast. It's going to be difficult once that appetite is established. If the appetite's changed, then the joy and the pleasure of what you're doing can change along with it. My wife and I, we have always enjoyed just simple, great love, simple, great joy. We went out of the country one time on an anniversary together on our 25th to celebrate. Other than that, you know, our favorite things to do is to drive down the street and go to a, a grocery store where they have like bulk candies and we both get our own little bag and we get the quantity that we, that's useful just for that day. Um, and and just the joy of things like that. Uh, I, I feel like what some people uh, what some people experience only when they get on a plane and go across the country we can absolutely experience the same kind of joy and love and passion literally driving down the street or literally in an activity in our backyard. But we establish these appetites that really just kind of ruin us for all the simple, wonderful things in life. It really does not require money, but we can experience the great passion and love and joy together as people without all the money expenditure. And that's very true. So let's talk a little bit. There's one question, or I I should say one statement that I've heard you say, and I'd really like to kind of dig into that. And that is that we are one conversation away from a dramatically changed life. That's a pretty bold statement. How is that possible? I tell you, it happens all the time in our interactions with people. First of all, say this. I totally believe that statement. 
But what prevents it from happening is two things. Number one, we don't tend to have the people in our life that we can have these conversations with. And number two, we don't tend to have the the vulnerability necessary to have these kind of conversations. Most of our conversations are just incredibly surface level. We don't tend to talk to someone uh, while we're playing golf and say, hey, hey, Lael, uh, I've been I've been struggling with this in business. We tend to just go through the whole round playing golf, simply having a good time, which is great, of course. But but these kind of conversations that we can have is when we tap into a place of frustration in our life or struggle. But these are the conversations we just tend to avoid. We feel like it's um, uh, we feel like it's too awkward to have these talks with somebody. So it, information's everywhere in the world. It is everywhere. And, you know, books, podcasts and whatnot. So there's there's all these books I can read. But when I have a conversation the element that I add is there is now someone who can read me. See, I can read a book and I can read a book by a great author giving great information. Let's say it's a book about starting your own business. And it might be the best business uh, uh, resource guy in the world, giving the best information in the world on starting your own business. And, and someone can read that and say, yes, this is how I can start this business. But if, but if you talk to someone in your life who knows you, then they can read you and say, you know, that is a great book by a great author giving great information, but you are not the human that should start a business. Or you are the person at this time in your life, starting a business would be ruinous for you. So to have that kind of uh, conversation with someone where someone gets to read you and say, you know, Here's what I see in you. It enables us to get the information that we most directly need to have. What does that say to you when you hear me say that? What feedback do you have? And so I agree with you about that. I think where I struggle is finding the right person to have the conversation with. Because mm. a lot of times people will just say yes to you or sure go try that they don't actually think through they don't say no which is what you're you're saying in this case right yes. yeah this yeah. is they don't say a... no and and i think like i know for a lot of people especially in the business world people are like i'm gonna go try this business and so they go to their friends and relatives and their friends and relatives are like oh that's so wonderful you should go do it and yet they've never actually tested it in the real world to see if it flies. Yeah. Usually our best friends are not the people to go talk to. What I encourage people to do is, uh, you know, I, I tell people other humans are your greatest life resource. I'm a fan of books. I'm a fan of podcasts, but other people that, that you can actually converse with are a great, great resource in our life. But what I encourage people to do is know them well enough to see if they are really living out with their life what they talk about. You don't want to talk to the guy and men do this. Men look at look at someone and say, wow, they have an awesome truck and they're, they have an, an awesome title uh, for their work. So they must be successful. I like to dig deep enough to know if someone's life really represents the kind of life that I would want to live. For instance, you know, Rocky, I, can't, I, um, I met you as part of a business group. I listened to a couple of your podcasts, and it was very clear to me that, that you're the real deal, that you don't just talk about something that's interesting, but you've lived out something that you talk about. When you find someone that lives out what they what they talk about, then they have that person has what I call the been there and done that anointing. <laughs> Better yet, I would say it this way, been there and done that the right way kind of anointing. 
for instance, when I, I listen to one of your podcasts where you talk to one of your daughters and I heard how she spoke about growing up in your house. I heard her speak about how she looks at life. And I, and listening to that, it was very clear to me, okay, Rocky is a guy who has been there and done that the right way. And so and in, in my line of work, I do some foundational coaching with people. I would have, without reservation, I would connect business owners to someone like you because you've been there and done that the right way. So I think the people that we can talk to and have these conversations with, I don't think they're hard to find. I just think we have to learn how to how to smell them out. You want to find someone who's been there and done that the right way. Usually it's someone who is at least 10 years down the road. And usually it just requires a cup of coffee. Um, I was struggling with a business decision about a year ago. I was struggling with how to make something happen. Now, for the first 20 years of my adult life, I was a standard a standard man that I would never reach out to help for people. I never said, I don't need help from anybody. I just never asked from it for help from anybody. So that was my just way of living. In the last about three years, I've learned that I shouldn't figure out anything on my own. And so if I struggle with something for, for a week, my first thought is, okay, where's my resource? Where's my friend or someone I know that has succeeded at what I am failing at that I can take to coffee and simply tell them, hey, I'm struggling with this. I'm seeing you successful at this. Can you give me the steps to take the number of times that I do that? And within one conversation, something I struggled with is an, I, I have immediate action steps and immediate confidence on how I should be approaching that thing. It happens all the time. It probably happens at, at my at my stage in life right now. I bet it happens at least once a month where there is something that's a roadblock for me and I simply tap into someone else and they have an immediate answer for my roadblock. And I think that's important. So one of the principles there is you do the work, but if you struggle, you don't give up. You find help to go through the roadblock. Because I think yeah. a lot of times people just go, oh, it didn't work out. They give up and they go do something else instead of saying, how do I break through this barrier? Someone else yes. has broken through this barrier. Let me find them and figure out what to do next. And so that does take, I guess, a bit of vulnerability. One of the things, and so the struggle for me is sometimes I don't think people evaluate the price you have to pay for the success you want. Mm. And so I'm always about understand what you're giving up and what is the price that you have to pay to achieve that particular success. And then the second thing is, I think you also have to figure out that you're in the right place. And, and the easiest way for me to explain that is, you know, if you look at a swimmer, a swimmer has a certain build. If you look at a runner, they have a certain build. A person with a runner's build is going to have trouble swimming. And a pe person with a swimmer's build is going to have trouble running. Mm -hmm. You've got to make sure you have the right fit for what it is that you want to do. So how do we, how do we in our conversations, figure that out? I guess that goes back to the beginning of what you said, right? Is someone should say to you, that's a great book, but it's not for you. Yeah. There again, it goes back to finding the right person. And for me, it's looking at someone's life and their life across the board speaks the message that, for instance, I want my life to speak. When I look at someone and I see that all the evidence that I can see of their life, how they do business, how they interact with people, their family, and I say to myself, you know, that that person, they live it out the right way. And that person is the type of person then that we can go to and simply start a conversation with. 
because they live it with their life. For instance, there's a lot of people out there everywhere that, that are selling something. I'm not looking for someone who's selling something. I'm looking for the person who's living something. I want to see, I want to talk to the person who's done it with their life, not just the person who's selling the stuff. Uh, I, I, I know people in my personal life that uh, I know them personally, but kind of at a distance that, that on social media, they're propagating that they are, a, for instance, like a life coach. And I see this from a distance, but I happen to go to the same gym that this person goes to. And I know some of kind of his behind the scenes and the guy is not living a life that he should be coaching anyone. He needs a life coach, but he shouldn't be a life coach. So there again, finding the, the, the finding the person in, and quite frankly, they're everywhere. But sometimes we just have to get outside of our own little circle, finding the person that's been there and done that the right way. And you can be one cup of coffee away from a dramatic change. But but I would also say this, something that and for most of my life there again, I think I represented a, a common person in that I never said I don't need help from anybody. I just also never tapped into help from anybody. Which which is why I think the need for things like life coaches and business coaches is becoming much more rampant because it's it's necessary. We live such isolated lives trying to prove things on our own and it's just harmful. We can't get any ground that way. And so uh, although I think there's a lot of people in the coaching industry that just like the idea of coaching and getting paid for it, uh, without a doubt, it has become a necessity that people like you said, the word pay the pay the price. Uh, I think if we I think if we are if we want to invest in our future and build a legacy, there's a price to be paid. And so in the last three years of my life, that is a new rhythm that I have put into play. And I tell you, it's, it's changed my life. I, I used to not believe in myself enough to hire someone to coach me. I changed my thinking and realized my life is way too important to not pay a price to have someone help me. And so I have just been blown away in the last three years that when I make an investment into my life by hiring someone to help me, and this is not a sales pitch, I, it's really not. Um, it, it's just a reality that you have to pay a price in life for anything. You pay a price for the for the, the goofy stuff that we buy. We pay a price for the car that we drive. And there's also a price to be paid to invest in our lives, in our in our in our leadership, uh, to pay a price to to build our family. It's just very again, it's just a change in perspective. We're fine paying a price for all kinds of entertainment. We just don't tend to want to pay a price to become a better human. And that's true. Most people don't have a self-improvement budget. Yeah. And putting money aside for that. Some people do. I've spent a lot of money on self-improvement and it's dramatically helped. We've had people on the show who have spent seven figures on self-improvement. It kind of depends where you're at and where you're going and what you want. And I think it's very important that when you go for help, you're right. You have to find the person who's living the life you want to live. And I think in business, this is really a struggle because there's a lot of people who are successful in business, but they are not successful. Their whole lives behind the scenes are a disaster. Yes. When I talk about the price, that's what I'm talking about, the disaster of your life, because you went all in on the business and you didn't pay attention to anything else. And I know right. for a good part of my life, I, I was, we all are taught that you have to do it alone. That was a mistake. You do need help. You can't do anything by yourself. In a sense, it's not bad to ask for help and it's not, it's, it's good. But yet I think, and I've heard you say this, people are ashamed to ask for help. Why is that? Yeah, I think it's just the default setting. Uh, it's just our default setting. Here's the, here's the, I think all of our stories are the same. 
I think everyone's story is the same. Number one, we're born. Number two, we're excited for a while. Number three, something happens. Either something happens to us or something happens because of us. And that leads us to number four, which is to go in the bushes and hide. Because we just don't, and, and until, we, until we learn differently, we just don't know how to deal with the messes of life. And our first response is to gasp and say, oh my gosh, I need to hide. And that's the best option. Uh, we all have examples of this in childhood. We all have examples of this in our adult life. <laughs> When I was uh, a little boy, I, I'll never forget the day in sixth grade where we had the chance to join in the band. And I went to the band room and the director, he asked me what instrument I wanted to play. And I said the trumpet because my older brother played that. And I guess in the early 80s, that was a cool, manly thing to play. And he handed it to me and he said, make a noise. And then he said something that literally changed my entire childhood. I couldn't make a noise out of the instrument. He, he took it from me and he said, your lips are too big. Now, he, I wish he had said the mouthpiece is too small, but he said, your lips are too big. Never in my life had I considered the size of my lips or anyone else's lips for that matter. But for the rest of my childhood, I considered it on a regular basis. It, it became the regular theme of my childhood. Now, I never went to anyone and said, you know, the band director said my lips are too big. Is that true? That would be the most incredibly awkward thing to ever do. I find it so interesting. The exact moment in life that we need simple help from somebody is the exact same moment that we feel completely compelled that I must hide. And the problem, of course, is in my hiding, there is no helping. And so I look at my entire childhood and think, wow, I, I was a pretty loving little boy. I, I always was. But my loving was held back by the fact that every time I walked into a room, I was literally thinking about, is anyone looking at the size of my lips? And that, that's, that's incredible to think back at that. But this is, that's a childhood example that's kind of funny now. But we literally, if we're not careful, we can live our entire life this way, where something simply happens. And instead of getting the simple help to get a perspective change, we live our life inside of this bush. That the, we got to hide this thing, but the problem is we end up hiding our whole life. We barricade ourselves from people. We barricade ourselves from the help that we need. So that's a childhood example in my life of how that played out. But the moment in life that we simply need a simple conversation to get help is the moment that we go into hiding. But the, the moment that we change this pattern of thinking, the rest of our life can be completely different, completely different. And th th that's probably one of the primary um, um, ways that we help people change their life is by changing that simple pattern. And that's impressive. As a business owner, you love what you do. It's why you started your business. However, the business of business causes you stress and anxiety and keeps you up late at night. Welcome to the club. Over 80% of business owners hate the business part of running a business. It doesn't have to be that way. No, you don't have to learn how to read complicated financial statements. We create systems that run in the background, and I implement the systems in conjunction with your bookkeeper and accountant analyze the information, and bring you better questions on how to run your business. It's a lot less expensive than you think to have a service like this, and not having it is why so many business owners struggle with money. The outcome is you can focus on what you love in your business, knowing that your finances are in order. Your business becomes more valuable, and banks are standing in line to provide working capital. 
you get to sleep at night. Learn more by listening to episode 163 with Mike Michalowicz as we discuss the process or go to ProfitComesFirst.com. Want to cut to the chase? There's a link in the show notes for a 15-minute no-obligation call to see if this makes sense for you. Schedule now and get your business on a rock-solid foundation. As I think through this, people do hide. And, and it's funny because every psychology book I read, all the problems are created when, by the parents when the kids are young. And we mm. carry that into adulthood. And so if we don't go back and fix our childhood problems, we're stuck. And then we're stuck yeah. in that loop <laughs> never to get out of it. So how did you get out of the loop? How did you let go of your lips? I tell you, what tends to happen is that childhood thinking, it just morphs its way into our adult living. For instance, so when I was a kid, Basically, the theme of my life is how do I look in front of people, which certainly is not living. <laughs> now, you're asking a big question there because, you know, as an adult, the theme of my life was not how big my lips were, but how big my body was. That became the theme of my life, my weight. I was probably overweight since about two days old. And over the course of childhood, it just nothing really changed. And then in adulthood, usually in adulthood, the the wrong thinking we develop as a child usually explodes. It multiplies itself out. So that kid that had some thought pattern for me, I'll just speak personally. As a child, the things that uh, that caused me to overeat, to kind of cope from my anxieties, as an adult, there was no one to rein me in. And so my coping could explode. My overweight could become very overweight. And so the theme of my life as an adult was always that I wanted to help people. I wanted to make a difference. But internally, the whole theme of my life was I am overweight. And, and until I'm overweight, I really can't make a difference with my life. Now, fortunately, this is the fortunate thing. The problem we have in our life is the exact problem that if we face it, it can become our life's greatest opportunity. When I was open and honest to face my struggle, I realized that this was not being overweight was my it was not my life's greatest failure. It was my it was an ugly package of my life's greatest opportunity for triumph and for building a legacy. When I began to see that differently, my my thought patterns begin to change. Because I, I'll just, my personal story, as an adult, probably 25 years as an adult, I simply told myself, I need to lose weight. Well, that thought does not cause anyone to lose weight. It just doesn't happen. I needed to tap into the right questions, like, why did I gain the weight? Which, quite frankly, tapping into that question tapped into the, the deepest level of who I really was as a human, not just as an adult, but like my whole, my whole existence <laughs> going back to childhood and my thought patterns that, that I, and I realized that, wait a second, my life has never been about what I looked like, whether it was my lips or my hips, my life has never been about what I looked like. And whether it was as a child or an adult, for me to limit my thinking of who I was as a man by what I look like was a stifling mindset. It was stifling to wake up every day and think, until I lose weight, I can't make a difference. Or as a child to think, well, I can't really love people or no one can really love me because my lips are too big. Like those very thought, uh, those very thought processes 
uh, were what caused me to stay overweight. So to go back to the, the simple story of our lives, number one, we're born. Number two, we're excited for a while. Number three, something happens either to us or from us. And it compels us to number four, which is to go to the bushes. But here's what's interesting. In the bushes, we begin to do something to cope. For me, <clears throat> food was how I coped. But let me explain this coping, uh, what, what happens with coping. You see, back to number two, the reason I'm excited about life, at our very core, we're excited about life because we believe that our life matters. We believe things like we can make a difference. We can impact the world. We, to use a, a visual from, uh, from the movie Braveheart, as a, as a man, we believe that we can be William Wallace against the evil empire, helping other people. But when something happens in our life and it sends us into the bush, consider this. That at one point, we thought our life could matter. And now, I'm just living in a bush, hiding. It's a horrible trade-off. That I, I was chasing a dream. I was believing in people. I was believing in what I could do in the world. And now I'm just hiding a problem. And until I get rid of this problem, I, all I can do is hide. And so it really, it really causes someone to cope. I, I think when a person goes into the bush, they begin to, to overeat even more because, quite frankly, the pain of leaving my life of legacy and purpose. I need something to cope to numb that pain. I think it's I think it, it leads men to alcohol. It leads people to drugs. It leads people to overworking. Because I need something to distract me from the the great pain that my life was at one time going to matter. And now I'm just hiding in a bush. And so what I came to as a man, what I, what I realized in my journey, if you can imagine a picture of that bush, when you're in the bush, you begin to cope. And let's say for me, it was coping with food. And so the, the lie that I told myself is I have to lose weight before I can make a difference. And the reason that lie is so harmful it's because if for me to believe I have to lose weight in order to make a difference, it's impossible. It, it becomes this mountain that you cannot climb, which causes you to eat more because you're more frustrated that I can't do this. And so that thing. So the, the big key for me was realizing my problem was not that I weighed too much. My problem was how I looked at my problem. And to, to, to just kind of tap into the, the freedom in the story was the step that I needed to take was not to lose a bunch of weight. The step I needed to take was to become vulnerable. And vulnerability has this amazing power to cause us to see our life differently. So what vulnerability looked like for me in my Bush experience is I just reached out to a man. I reached out to a guy I did not know who I knew at one point weighed over 300 pounds and he got down below 200. And I thought to myself, I'm calling that guy today. And it was very awkward to do. But I called him and simply admitted, I need help with this. Now, He's been a great coach and a great resource. But a secret sauce in our life is that if we will become vulnerable, we feel like we're going to expose ourselves to shame. But what we really expose ourselves to is things like hope and help and freedom. When I became vulnerable enough to make the call and simply say to a stranger, I need help. Can you help me? 
it, it changed me. It set me on a course of complete change. So that's, that's a, 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 a mouthful right there, that whole story. But as we talk with people, it, it's been amazing to me how often this is the recurring story of people's lives. We were born, we're excited, something happens, we go into a bush. When we get in the bush, we then create behaviors that seem like our life problem. And then our entire focus becomes changing my behavior that was caused by the bush. But really, we need to tap into what sent us into the bush more so than hyper focus on what at what began to happen because I went into the bush. I hope that makes some sense. I wish I had a whiteboard to draw this thing out. I love drawing this picture. It makes total sense. <clears throat> and it's a struggle. It's funny because... I also went through a weight loss journey. It was funny how many people would ask me later, well, how'd you do it? And I told them, I mean, it was essentially diet and exercise. And they'd look at me like, and they'd walk away because nobody wants to do the work. Yeah. One of the things that I think is important, and I know you do this with a lot of people and help them. Mm -hmm. And I think it's the underlying probably core principle here. We need a purpose in life. We need to know yeah. what it is that we want. And it doesn't have to be this big, massive purpose. And so I'd like you to talk about your thoughts around having a purpose and how you help people to find their purpose. Yeah, I love this because to have purpose is such a, a courageous thing to live with. It takes guts and courage to live with purpose, but it changes how we live. It's much easier to not live purposefully. Then we don't have a standard to live up to. But to live with purpose is so invigorating. It's so life-giving. I'm going to go back just for a second to give a story to illustrate what I just talked about with the bush. This, I think this is important to give an example here. So a young man recently, he sent me a message via video. He's in his young 20s. He sent me a video message. And he explained a problem that he was having because he was living life in the bush. He said, I'm having trouble with how I look at women. He was, he was being honest about struggling with, with lustful thinking. And he was being honest. You could tell it was very awkward for him which vulnerability is always awkward. You can't escape it. But vulnerability always is also powerful. And it was incredible to watch this. It was about a four-minute video. He awkwardly explained his, his thinking and the thinking he wants to change. And then at the end of the video, he said, you know, just in talking about this, I think I know what my problem is. Now, this is just mind bending to me because usually when we have a problem, we need to think, I just need to change that problem. If I eat too much, I need to stop eating so much. If I have a problem with um, spending too much money, I need to stop spending too much money. But here's what he said. I think I know what my problem is. I don't think I believe and trust that there's a woman out there for me. Now, that is that is the mindset that took him into the bush, that tapping into that kind of mindset change will cause him to change his behavior. But if he wakes up every day as a young man and says, OK, my goal today is to not have lustful thoughts about a woman. Well, that's not going to change behavior. But if he wakes up every day and says, you know what, there's a woman for me. And I am the man for that woman. He begins to live with this purpose that will give him a power to then live differently. So in, in stories like that, it just excite me. I had to share one of them, but that's the recurring kind of theme that happens in our conversations is when people become vulnerable, they expose themselves to the kind of thinking change that really needs to happen. 
So back to how, I, how we help people with purpose. We go through a process. We call it the purpose mastermind. And all it is is three conversations. The first conversation, we talk about the four mindsets that we commonly have that prevent us from, from understanding our purpose. The second meeting, we talk about the three simple, powerful, eternal mindsets that if we simply think according to these mindsets, we can clearly know our purpose. And then our, in our third meeting, everyone comes back and everyone simply says the purpose of their life. And th that meeting for me is, is Christmas morning. Uh, the excitement of, of, of seeing people become excited about their future and who they can be. I, I like to say this, it tends, this process tends to take people from being a pussycat to a lion. And there's many examples I could give. Let me, um, let me share one of them. Uh, we've done this with people in their fifties and we've done this with people down to 18 years old, but an 18 year old recently was in one of our groups for young guys and this guy, he's healthy as can be. He's a very good soccer player, but his anxiety literally sent him to the emergency room. His pulse rate was out of control. If, if he was at school and someone asked him about what he's going to do after he graduates, he would look down at his Apple Watch just to watch his pulse go crazy because his anxiety was just overwhelming him. I asked him in this first meeting, so who do you talk to about your, these life decisions? And of course, he said the common answer. He said, nobody. What was amazing that we talked to him for 20 minutes and within 20 minutes, he had decided that's what I'm going to do in the next season of my life. These are the steps I'm going to take simply by having a conversation that he's not having with anybody. He had immediate action steps and they weren't action steps that were forced on him. It was just in the talking about it, he began to have answers and, and ideas. The very next day, he went to his school and went to the counselor's office and he said, how do I sign up for this program? And it's a, a program for free education right here in our county that he can do for the next two years to get all of his core classes done. He then went to another office and signed up for a concurrent enrollment class to begin college that very day. He came back the second week for a meeting and he said, you know, he said, I feel free. That's what he said. 18 years old. He said, I feel free. He, he knew what he could do with his life. He began to look at it differently. And probably the most exciting thing was in our third meeting where everyone comes back and they talk about the purpose of their life. And as, as an 18 year old, to be able to, to be, able, be able to articulate things that probably he would never talk about in his life, but instead he's 18 and he's talking about it. And he began to describe a particular thing in his life. He said, you know, people have said that I'm OCD because he's the guy that everything in his bedroom has a place and a purpose. He's a real organized, neat guy. And he said, you know, I don't, I don't have a problem. I'm not OCD. He said, this is like a gift I have for the world. And he realized that he said, I have management skills in me. And it was so exciting to talk to him and be like, do you think there's need for people that are good at managing things in this world? <laughs> do you think there's businesses that need stuff like that? Yeah, it's needed everywhere. So that's that's one example of one guy that in this process can so quickly. I look at this process. It's like a defibrillator that, you know, paddles on the chest of your life and boom. You can look at it differently in a moment and, and begin to make, take action steps in a moment. So that's one example, one story. And I think for a lot of people, it's number one, stopping 
and getting off the hamster wheel. Yeah. It's creating the space for the conversation, having the vulnerability tell your truth and your fears. And it's not that the other person's going to give you answers, because I don't think, I don't know that you gave him answers, but I think he looked within and he found his own answers and opportunities. And that happens. I know for me, when I, when I have a problem and I get a chance to talk it through with somebody, even if they're doing nothing but listening, I find yeah. my solutions. Oh, so true. Right? They're in me. Everything I need is available to me. I, I just got to get through the, to the reflection in the mirror and fix it. And just having, having the time, the space, and the ability to do that is is big and it's important and then it's digging in to figure out what is really true and actually taking the time to to look at the situations and the opportunities that are there more often than not we we ignore a lot of the signals we don't want to deal with them because it's like you just don't want to deal with them i guess that's probably what the end is you know we get the red flags and we just ignore them because we don't take the time. Yeah, we'd rather just adapt the story and say something like, well, this is how it is for everybody. Um, I think about as a man, for instance, concerning my issue with weight, I wanted to do, I, would, I was willing to do anything to change except be vulnerable. But being vulnerable is the only thing <laughs> that I needed to do that would cause change in my life. When I became vulnerable and had literally a conversation, it put me on a track that changed everything. I would say this for most people, the moment they're willing to be vulnerable is the moment that the light comes on. I look at it like this, that, and I think this pattern repeats itself in our life and it's a continual kind of pattern we go through, but I look at like like this, the people in, in an area of their life, it's like they're living in a dark room. And all around them are three or four answers that that easily would help them take their next step in life. And in that dark room is this great big mirror that a quick glance in the mirror would cause you to simply say, oh, this is what I am as a person. I should work on that. But the problem is, it's just dark. The room is dark. Vulnerability, it, it's almost like magic. It's almost like magic. It is a conversation that unbeknownst to ourselves and unbeknownst to the listener, it's like it turns the light on. And all of a sudden, those answers that were right beside you, you can, you can easily pick it up and be like, oh, I can do this. And that one glance in the mirror, gives the revelation of, oh, that, that's how I'm functioning as a person. I should probably work on that. And so vulnerability is, that, is the conversation that causes the light to come on. And it's powerful. It's absolutely powerful. But usually when it comes to life change that we want, we want it to do, we want to do it in our own power. Like, I'm going to make this happen. Usually the same person that caused the problem it's not usually the same person, the same thinking that gets you out of the problem. That vulnerability, that conversation changes the thinking. And when thinking changes, then behavior can change. I'd, I'll tell you one more story. Our last group of, of college guys, one of them, uh, in, in our first meeting, we talk about uh, vulnerability. We touch on this and it's a, it's a group of, it was a group of young guys. And so I, I kind of set a trap for them. We, we giggle, I get them giggling and laughing about how, how we're not very vulnerable as men. And they all admit that they're not very vulnerable. And then I tell them, you know what guys, <clears throat> if do you have a story in your life that you're afraid to tell, and I, I, I put a finger in their chest and I say, listen, the story that you're afraid to tell, you've got six days to tell it. And I tell them about how important it is they tell their story. 
So this one young man, I've uh, I've known his life a little bit, and he's a classic 19-year-old young man. He lived much of his life as a teenager just being the guy that giggles a lot. Because for many men, sometimes the man that laughs the most is the man that's just trying to steer away from anything serious. Oftentimes, that young man that's always looking to joke around is the guy that that is afraid to face his own stuff. So I compelled them with that assignment. And he came back the next week and I asked him, I asked this one young man, did you tell your story? And he said, yeah. And he talked about sitting in a hot tub with three friends. And, and I, I, I know enough of these guys that it was just three young guys. There wasn't a whole lot of, of what you would call wisdom in the hot tub. Uh, it was just three. You look, there's usually not a lot of wisdom in 19, 20 year old young men. He said it was so awkward, but I just told my story. And here's what he said. As soon as I started talking about it, I looked at my life differently. He said, I can't explain it. And, and, and quite frankly, this young man he really, he really doesn't even, I was shocked that he even could form these words because I don't think he even understood what happened to him, but he described perfectly what happened. He said, when I finished telling my story, I saw my whole life differently. He said, it felt like a car was lifted off my chest. And then after that conversation, he did two other things. He said, my grandma died a year ago. She was the only person on the planet that I could talk to about things that were bothering me. But she died. I went to her funeral, but I couldn't, I didn't, I, I couldn't get myself to go to the graveside. I never did. He said, last week I went to the graveside. He became, he became, from just a conversation, he became the young man that saw his whole life differently and began to live his life differently. And he talked about this, really this touching, heartwarming moment at this graveside. And then at that next meeting, he said, he began to talk about this other problem in his life that's incredibly common. He talked about, and he said, you know, my dad has never approved of me. And I think to myself, that is probably one of the most common issues that a man deals with in his life. But oftentimes a man will never verbalize it because it's incredibly awkward to say. And within 20 minutes in this conversation with, with, some, with some guidance, he was able to see that his life and what it's going to be does not hinge upon who his dad is to him. That his whole life is not going to be defined by that. And once again, for him, it was like this car being lifted off of his chest. That he can think different. He can be different. That he can face his life with boldness and courage. So th those are just a couple stories from this mastermind that when people just have a, a, key, a key conversation, their entire outlook on themselves and their entire outlook on their future and who they can be can, can pivot literally in a moment. What got us here won't get us there. And yes, <laughs> that's literally what it comes down to. And so... The thinking that got us here is not the thinking that's going to get us to the next step. Throughout this thing, you have talked about giving action steps to people, giving them challenges. I'd like for you to do that for the audience. What's one thing the audience can do this week to dramatically change their life? Well, this is where some of the people might want to turn off the podcast because here it comes. I just I can't I can't not give this action step because I see it over and over and over again, dramatically pivot people's life. If there's a story in your life that you're afraid to tell, it's the story that you must tell. 
It doesn't have to be with a counselor. It can be. But it's a story that you must tell. Think about it. If it wasn't that big of a deal, why is it you're afraid to talk about it? If it really doesn't matter, if it really doesn't impact your life, why is there the fear of uttering the words out of your mouth? Here's what I find. The story, that we, the, the story in our life that we want to bury, just, just bury it. No one's going to know. No one will find out. It's all just going to be fine. We haven't buried it. We've planted it. And whatever you plant will grow. So the thought that we can bury it and it's just going to out of sight, out of mind, it's almost like it's this thing that we've planted in the foundation of our life. And it's like these weeds and vines grow up out of that thing and begin to wrap, metaphorically speaking, wrap around our legs and grow up our body. And eventually just a vine wraps itself around our throat and slowly just kinds to begin to stifle us. Here's the, here's the good news. By having one conversation, one time, telling your story, it is amazing how quickly that story gets uprooted. And when it gets uprooted, it begins to die in its power over your life. Those vines are now dead, and you can have the, the boldness to just pull them off your body and begin to think differently about yourself. Think differently about your relationships and the impact and legacy you can have in the world. That's my action step. If you got a story you're afraid to tell, it's the story that you must tell. And that's super powerful. Super, super powerful. Thank you for sharing that. It's time to learn the secrets of life. What's your secret to living an abundant life? Mm. I would say stewardship. Stewardship that the, the results, uh, my goal every day is to simply be good dirt. My goal is to be good ground that God can plant something in me and he can water and cause something to grow. So stewardship is like the farming that I'm that I have a role to play in my life, that I I work the ground, I sow the seeds, but then I trust in the rain to come. So stewardship is the key to my life that I have a role to play, but I'm not the owner of anything. I'm only the steward. And that sounds so simple, but it's very hard to do. <laughs> we keep coming yes, back to is. that principle. Yeah. What did you learn later in life that you wish you would have learned sooner? Vulnerability. Without a doubt. I was always the guy that I would, I would never say, I don't need help from anybody. Mm -hmm. I just never said, I need help from somebody. And now that I have learned vulnerability, if I struggle with a decision for, for a number of days, I just tap into the resource of a friend or, or someone that's successful at something. It's amazing how quickly it pivots my life. It's amazing how quickly it pivots me. But quite frankly, vulnerability is the one step that I took that caused me to, in my mind, mentally, I lost 100 pounds in a second the day, the day I became vulnerable. Since that day, I have lost a lot of weight physically, but I lost the weight mentally first, and vulnerability was the key to that. And that's powerful. You've talked a lot about coaching younger adults, and so I think this question is probably perfect for you. If you were to give an 18-year-old one specific piece of wisdom, what would it be? Oh, boy. What a, what a great question. Most of our training with with parents and the training we did um, with our kids at the youngest of ages, just all the fundamental, just the, the core thinking that a human is to have. 
uh, it's almost uh, it's almost daunting to me to think of giving advice to an 18 year old because it could be that they're thinking that they've been living with for 18 years is just going to stifle their life. Uh, if I was to give one piece of advice, uh, it would probably be to, it, this goes into our purpose mastermind. It would be for them to have some conversations with some people who have been there and done that. Do not figure out life on your own. That's what I would tell them. Don't you dare think that you're supposed to figure out life on your own. Find someone who's been there and done that. Take them to coffee and say, you know, I like how you live your life. What steps do you see that I can take to get where I want to go in life? That's the advice I would give. And, you know, for a lot of 18 year olds they are about to go to college um, or whatever path they're, they're picking for themselves. I think it's important for them to go have conversations with the people who are doing what they want to do later in life yeah. from, from a job standpoint. Understand what it truly is, because what really hurts is when you spend two hundred thousand dollars to get a degree that you're no longer going to use because it turned out it wasn't what you thought it was. And so having those conversations is phenomenal. I will tell you that if you're 18 years old, get on LinkedIn. You would be amazed at how many people will open their door and and share with you their journey. And that's literally what you want to go ask. Share yeah. your journey. What's it really like to live where you are and what was the price you paid to get there and then decide if that's for you or not for you. So I think that's perfect advice. No, it's it's great. Most people, we venture off into life and our and our core thinking is I need to prove myself. That thinking wrecks us. Instead, what we need to do is figure out what can I give to my world? But the conversations we can have with people, and I, I totally agree with you. Talk to someone who's doing the work you want to do and and talk to them about what your life looks like and let them let them turn the light on for you. But the feeling that I got to prove myself and I got to figure this out on my own are two dangerous, dangerous thoughts for anybody. Very true. If people would like to find out more about you, your training programs, your masterminds, what is the best way for them to find you and connect? Yeah, there's two websites. One is mylifeplatform.com. And this is where you find we have video courses on parenting and marriage. This is where you'll, you can gain access to the Purpose Mastermind. We also have a program called My Life Platform, where we guide couples through five conversations to help them build the, leg, build the foundation upon which to, to uh, build a life that leaves a legacy. And the other website is markdelaney.me. This is uh, for to the work the work I do in the marketplace. I do presentations and trainings on things like uh, how to be the hero in conflict. So businesses have me come in to talk to their staff about um, uh, about conflict issues. I also do uh, keynote talks on how to change your life by doing one thing one time. So so those are the two sites: markdelaney.me and mylifeplatform.com. And I will put them in the show notes. Thank you so much for joining us today and sharing your wisdom. Thank you. It's been a pleasure. I love your podcast. I love what you're doing. Thank you, Mark. Mark has a special offer for you. If you'd like to go through the Purpose Mastermind, he's offering 25% off the price. And the price is really reasonable to begin with. Check out the offer at the link in the show notes. There are separate groups for students, young people, men, women, couples. It's all broken down by age and gender. And so you'll be with a group of like-minded people. These conversations could change your life. I always encourage people to find clarity when they can. As I mentioned before, I've been through Mark's class and I enjoyed it. My purpose statement at the end was, the purpose of my life is to serve God, my family, and community and help others achieve financial and time freedom. I try to live in congruence with my work and my life. They all flow together. This week's action step was, is there a story in your life you're afraid to tell? Then you must tell it. I think I do my best to share my stories on this podcast. 
If you want someone to share your story with, Mark and I are both happy to listen or read your work. We won't share it with anyone else. It won't cost you anything. And I promise to read it and to respond to you. So if you need someone, we're here for you. What's preventing you from moving forward and who are you putting on your team to help build the life you deserve? Taking no action creates a far worse outcome in life than trying something and failing. If I can help you achieve your goals through coaching and accountability, email me and we can start with a short chat to see if we're a good fit for coaching or just click the link in the show notes to get on my calendar. For many people, one session allows them to take a giant leap forward towards their dreams. You can always get me at rocky at richersoul.com. I'd love to hear how you're doing and how the information I've shared has helped. Thanks for listening. Have an abundant week.